What is your opinion as an astrophysicist on the meteor shower which fell two weeks ago? The meteor shower in Russia? Yes. What's my opinion about it? Well, <laughs> shit happens, I suppose. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, it's so good to get a laugh. I'll have to have a drink. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, it's, to me, it, was, it makes me smile, to be honest, because we all got very excited about this, um, this pretty large asteroid which was plotted from years ago, and some of us tried to see it in the sky. It, it, it was in the northern skies, and its path was actually plotted very carefully, and we knew it was going to pass close to us, actually 27,000 miles, which is damn close when you consider the moon is half a million miles away. But we knew we were safe. So there was this kind of comforting feeling in, in, uh, in the public sector. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, bang, on the other side of the world comes a meteor which breaks up before it gets down to Earth. And nobody saw it coming. Nobody saw. So we, our feelings of security on this planet are very unfounded. There's going to be an awful lot of stuff out there which we don't know about, particularly tired old comets. Because after comets have been round a few times, they get stuff blown off them by, by the solar wind, and they become rather dark objects. Their albedo is very low, so it's very hard to see them. And I've seen some pretty frightening estimates of thousands of, of objects out there which we don't know about, could be on a collision course for Earth, and if they are, and they're bigger than a fridge, we are in deep, deep trouble because you can't do anything. You can't get there quick enough. If you try to explode them, the pieces will probably spread on other places. You know, you, you, we've watched them. Um, what's it called? Deep Impact? What's it called? The film where they go up and try and shoot it down, you know. What's it called? Armageddon. Armageddon, that's right, yes. Yeah, you know, so um, complacency, I think, uh, is misplaced. That would be what I got from that meteor shower. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Um, Dennis Tito has just announced that he's looking for an older couple to uh, represent Earth on a trip to Mars. Would you be tempted? <laughs> They're looking for a couple? An older couple. An older couple? <laughs> <laughs> so is that, is that, um... <laughs> you don't mean me, obviously. <laughs> um, who's, who's asked for this? Um, the Inspiration Mars Foundation. I think they're a private enterprise who want to go to Mars. Oh, I see. So the idea is you go to Mars, but you don't come back, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds perfect. <laughs> um, I think there's an awful lot to do on this planet. I had the privilege of speaking at Starmus a couple of years ago, which was a festival put on by a friend of mine about astronomy and astrophysics and space exploration and music. It's a bit of an ambitious thing. And along with a lot of the astronauts, the original astronauts and cosmonauts from America and Russia, I stood up and said what I thought about space exploration. And the subject which I was given, because people know how I feel, my, my subject was what are we doing in space? Uh, so I have a strong feeling that um, it was wonderful for astronauts to go into space, how brave they were and how skillful they were. But is it right for the rest of us, if we are able to go flooding into space and, and spreading our nastiness and mess and whatever, our greed and destruction, onto other planets? So I, I have a strong feeling that we do not have the right, necessarily, to infest the whole universe. What we ought to be doing is getting our own planet right first. So I think I'll stay here and try and make sure that happens. So, um, I believe you're an expert in interstellar dust clouds, is that correct? I, that's my thesis study. Okay, so I'm just wondering... Well, actually, not interstellar dust clouds, but really circum, <laughs> circumsolar dust clouds. So, as a person who lived a really exciting life in music, you were able to put um, all of that sort of on the back burner to pursue dust clouds for mm. a while, and I'm just wondering... Um, what really gets you going about dust clouds, if you have something particularly awesome to share about them? <laughs> what gets me going about dust clouds? <laughs> it's the pursuit of knowledge, darling, isn't it? Mm. Um, funny thing is, it happened almost by accident. I, I did my first degree at Imperial College, uh, physics degree, 
and then wanted to stay in physics and particularly astronomy. I'd always loved astronomy because finally, and so finally my opportunity was there. And I went for a, num a number of interviews. One was at Jodrell Bank and they actually uh, offered me a job, which was amazing. I turned it down to stay at Imperial College where I was to go into the infrared astronomy department. And by a strange quirk of fate, what they were doing was mainly not infrared astronomy. It was actually mainly spectroscopy, invisible light spectroscopy. And they were studying dust in the solar system. And I thought, well, I would like to do this. You know, so I just kind of fell into it. And um, I was very lucky because it was something very challenging. And although people had done a lot of studying of, of zodiacal dust, it's called zodiacal dust because it's mainly in, in the plane of the zodiac that you find this dust. Um, although a lot of studies had been done with it just photometrically, nobody had really done dynamical studies. And we were able, by looking at the, the reflected light from dust in the solar system and analysing its spectrum, we were able to see Doppler shifts in the lines. And so we were able to figure out the direction and speed of the dust as opposed to just where it was. So to me, it was a fascinating and different kind of exploration. And it's very odd, when I left, um, the subject fell to pieces, you know, obviously. <laughs> and strangely enough, not much was done in the 30 years that I went out and played guitar. And I came back to it 30 years later, and there was really only one significant paper that had been published on it, because zodiacal dust was considered to be a bit of a dead issue. You know, why would people be that much interested in dust? What had happened, though, in just a couple of years before I came back to it, was that we discovered dust clouds around other stars. And this became something which people started to realize was a normal part of the evolution of a solar system. So suddenly everybody wanted to study dust again, and where better to study it than on our own doorstep in our own solar system. So suddenly what I was doing became relevant again. Um, and the 30 years just melted away. <laughs> and I, I mean, I had to really seriously clear my life. I had to do a year just focusing on on trying to finish off the PhD. I'd done four years already in 1970s. I did one extra year, was it four years ago now, and completed the, the PhD. So I hate being called Mr. May now. <laughs> you do not know. Any, any PhDs here? Yeah, yeah. What does it feel like? Do you ever want to be called Mr. again? Once, you, <laughs> once you've been through that stuff, right? You want to be called Doctor. So that's the way it is with me. So. <laughs> Hi there, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was just wondering if you'd consider following the late Sir Patrick Moore on Sky at Night. Ah, uh, a lot of people have said this. The truth is I couldn't, really. Um, Patrick was an amazing man and he became a, a wonderful friend and mentor to me. Um, but the amount of, I mean, first of all, his knowledge was so broad, they just don't make them like that anymore. Patrick, did, these days you, you will ask an astronomer a question and he'll, he'll go to a book or he'll go to a website or something and he'll be able to answer it for you. But Patrick would just have it all in his head. And particularly the moon, which was his particular uh, area of expertise. You know, he wouldn't be looking up any books. He would be saying, well, of course, if you keep on walking past Aristarchus and you turn right, you'll come to the Great Wall of... You know, he, he lived in the universe. He understood it. And his dedication was colossal. He lived and breathed astronomy. And I couldn't do that. I have too many other things to do. I just couldn't do it. it it's very flattering that some people have thought that I could carry on the sky at night. But I think the Sky at Night's in very good hands. You know, Chris Lintott has been a big part of Sky at Night for a very long time. He has his, his team around him. And I think they did a very good job on the first uh, Sky at Night without Patrick, very much in the, in the same mould, this sort of gentle sharing of knowledge and sharing of enthusiasm. So I will just continue to be a friend of Sky at Night. I know these people and, and I have enormous affection for them. And what Patrick achieved is incredible. You know, almost single-handedly, he made us aware of what's out there and made us excited about it. And almost every astronomer, whether amateur or professional, will say to you, I was inspired by Patrick Moore. And that there's no greater uh, tribute that you could pay to the man. Um, in fact, he would have been 90 years old on the 4th of March. So we're having a little bash down in, in Celsi to, to honour him and celebrate him. Very down home, a few, a few of us will speak. Sorry? So, that, you know, uh, and possibly, sorry, I thought I heard somebody say something. Um, and we're hoping that there will be a bigger celebration of, of Patrick's life later in the year. 
Um, but the sky at night, I think, will do very nicely. And uh, you know, I will always be on hand. I'd love to go in and do a little bit again, maybe at some point. But but I, I won't be the anchor man. Thank you.